Are the doors locked? Yes, they are locked. We check one more time. Eins, zwei, drei, ja. Yeah. I have a, an in-law who's a German. Yeah, German, German. Born and raised in Germany, still lives there, Stefan. And, uh, and, you know, sometimes he says stuff that's arrogant too, right? I mean, I, so I, I'm gonna send him that. <laughs> like, okay, like here's an example. He loves cars, knows, loves cars, knows everything about them. So we're talking about cars, and he's, he's just, he'll say something like, I don't know how the, uh, the, the Germans would never buy the American cars, of course, because we have the German cars. And why? <laughs> they are better engineered and designed, but why would we ever purchase something that is inferior to what we have making in our own cities? But, uh, <laughs> We are not here to discuss the obvious. <laughs> I must say, I would love to see how it works in your country with also those American cars breaking down on the highway every day. <laughs> Must be quite hilarious. Maybe you have the German tow trucks to come and clean up the cars. I have two cars. Ironically, I have a Volkswagen Jetta. I know, I know, ironically. And a Ford F-150 pickup truck. Arf, I know. It's a 1989. I, I, even better, I know, I bought it for a thousand dollars. Mainly because I hit my 40s and realized, you know what? Every now and then a man needs to haul some stuff. <laughs> That's right. And, and I got really tired of having that totally emasculating conversation with a friend who has a truck. Can I buy your truck for half a day? Because I have some man things to do, but I don't have a vehicle that does man stuff, so I just need your man thing. Can I let me use it? I'll give it right back. I know you have man stuff too all the time. I just have a little bit, just a little tiny bit, and I'll be done. And, and can I borrow your man card? Because I think I need it to drive it, right? They won't let me unless I have. Yeah. So it was worth a grand to not have that conversation. <laughs> what I didn't know about having an old pickup truck is they are so much fun to drive, especially in a big city, right? You can, first of all, you don't care what happens to them. It's an old, rusty truck. Oh, it's, it's, I'm, it's so empowering. I pull up to a four-way stop and then I go, right? The other four cars or three cars can figure out who's going after me, but <laughs> that's up to them, but no one's challenging the... The 89 rust bucket, coming through everybody. You feel like a tugboat with tires all around. Go ahead, bump me, I don't care. Add some character. You can help the police, that's the best. You can be a vigilante in your own neighborhood. You can, you go pull out into traffic, there's a car bombing along at the speed of light, and you think, oh my gosh, if I pull out now, he will rear end me. So you do, you do, right? Like, hey, you better slow down, sporty. Woo! That, that is not the speed limit in this neighborhood. Go ahead and nest your grill into my trailer hitch. I'll give you a tow to where you want to go. I haven't, I don't have a boat or nothing. So anyway, so I, get, I get home from this family gathering over in Europe, uh, hop into my Jetta, won't start. Oh, what is the problem with the German engineering? It's just so clickety click clicky. You know why I wouldn't start? I, I, the mechanic said before I go on a long trip, I should unhook a battery cable or something because apparently my over-engineered piece of German genius won't stop thinking about stuff the whole time I'm gone. Right, I've got this car just sitting into my driveway talking to itself for two weeks. Are the doors locked? Yes, they are locked. We check one more time. Eins, zwei, drei, ja. Ja. The sun has gone down, lights the clock. Bing! Oh, someone is too close to the car. Alarm! Boop, 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 boop. Oh, vigilance is tiresome. Anyway, hop out of this Jetta, jump into my Ford. This thing hasn't had an oil change since I was in high school. I swear to you, it has. I put new oil in, but it just sort of goes away after a while. I just, it's this one-way oil system. One turn of the key, just You know why? Because while I was away for two weeks, my pickup wasn't thinking about squat. It was just sitting there under a tree in my backyard. 
Oh, 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 you're back? Okay, we're gonna go haul some stuff, stop an Audi? Cool, let's do this. I know it's kind of funny, but I have never felt such national pride as the moment that blue-gray smoke fired out the tailpipe of that rusty old pickup. Just... Go America! Da -da -da. Da -da -da -da. Right. And I took out my iPhone and made a video of myself uh, towing the Jetta to the mechanic, right? With, with full narrative, by the way. <laughs> Stefan, look how well your car tows! Yes! <laughs> there is no vowel on the corners! <laughs> These are called small family victories, and they are the most important, so... <laughs> Oh, this is fantastic. I'm actually uh, very excited to be invited to do this, uh, this series and uh, was uh, kind of beating myself up a bit about uh, what kind of what jokes I was going to tell. And, uh, but that's, that has nothing to do with y'all. Uh, I've, I've just, uh, I'm a very indecisive person. Yeah, I am. I, I, I learned this about myself a few years ago in the oddest place while watching Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I need to set this up. Uh, I was told going into Lord of the Rings that uh, the characters are based on mythic images that are embedded in our collective unconscious. So the character you identify with the most is speaking to who you truly are at the core of your being. I don't know. That's a lot of baggage to take into a matinee, right? And I found it extra disturbing when I started to connect with that Gollum guy, the Smeagol, the... Yeah. That bald guy who crawls around arguing with himself all the time. We want the precious. <laughs> we want it. Hobbits stole it from us and we want it. But the hobbits are our friends. No, they're not our friends. <laughs> thieves. Filthy, dirty thieves. No, he destroys the precious in the fires. No, we takes the precious and we will be the bastards. All right. So... I'm watching that, and to be totally honest, the only thought in my head the whole time is, oh my gosh, I think like that all the time. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious, I'll be at a Starbucks getting a drink. Can I have a single short latte, please? We can get the lemon bread. We want the lemon bread, we do. <laughs> it looks so precious. <laughs> Don't get it, it'll make us fat. Shut up, I'll go jogging in the morning. I'll run off the tricksy little sweet bread. I no, you won't. You'll sleep in. You say you run your sleep right in. Shut up! I deserve it. I deserve it. <laughs> yes, standing behind some woman at the grocery store checkout aisle with really cool hair, kind of piled up into some mystical Jenga tower, <laughs> held together with a single stick. Don't touch it, she's just buying eggs. Shut up, me thinks as if I pulls this Trixie stick. The tower stays. Us. Anyway, so I got that going on inside my head all day long. In case we talk later. I like, I, I, I like trying new things, though. I'm not, I'm not against you know, new experiences, but they don't always work out. Recently, I, uh, uh, I was told that if I, if I really wanted to relax, relax to a deeper state of relaxation than I'd ever achieved before, I should go to a day spa. Yeah, sure, okay, yeah, if you say so. I've never been so uptight in my life <laughs> as I was my two hours at the day spa. <laughs> I kind of blame myself. I think I was trying too hard. Because right, I'm very goal-oriented. Come on, let's do this. Mm, let's relax. Come on. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> this is how I feel at home. It's not happening. Mrs. Bull, eighty dollars. <laughs> and then they had this Eastern music playing. Is that what you know? That bing, bang, bang. Sounds like a cat walking on a piano or something. <laughs> <laughs> These ninja notes jumping out. <laughs> It's not relaxing. The worst part, this bowl of rocks and water they had in the corner just gurgling away. <laughs> Great, I'm lying here, I'm naked, now I gotta pee.
$80. I could have bought 15 bacon double cheeseburgers for $80. Relaxed in my backyard for a whole weekend. Just, oh, I can't move. <laughs> That's a spa day. <laughs> I'm more of an outdoors person, to be honest. Outdoors. I have a yellow lab. I read the other day that yellow labs have, on average, 100 facial expressions. And I was like, what? That sounds ridiculous. I started watching my dog. It's true. There's one for aggression, <sighs> one for submission, <sighs> and 98 for, oh, are you going to eat that? I have a theory why men like to hunt and fish, though. I think men hunt and fish because if guys are going to spend a lot of time together, just two of you in some remote place, just the two of you alone, something eventually has to end up dead. <laughs> Otherwise, it starts to feel too much like a date. <laughs> it does. Most men cannot go up to their friend, hey, do you want to get up really early tomorrow and go row a boat around the lake for a couple hours? We'll sit close and whisper. No, what? <laughs> but you throw in, I'll bring my gun in case we see a duck. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah, let's go for the weekend, just us. <laughs> I mean, yeah, 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 men are uncomfortable, but you, yeah, the guy's fishing, you just tow, you don't have to have, get, have good bait, just tow a string with a hook on it. Just, we can do this for hours, we're gonna catch a big one. Pull the string out. Are we done? No, I just thought we'd kind of paddle about for a bit. Put the string in. It feels better. I feel more comfortable with the string. <laughs> My college job in, uh, when I was in college, I, I, I was a hiking guide up in Alaska. Yeah, I know you're, you're mountain people here, so you're thinking, why would you need a guide for a hike? And I realize, yes. <laughs> it is a fairly self-explanatory activity. There are two green sides and a brown line going down the middle. You just kind of stay on the brown line. <laughs> when you get half tired, turn around, go back. Okay, I think we hiked. I passed the test. I can be a guide now. But in Alaska, people want a guide. You know why? You know why? The bears. They're concerned about bears. And they want somebody at the front of the line with, uh, with some kind of bear stopper. So I was equipped with a can of cayenne pepper spray, or bear mace is what it is. I, you know, people felt safe. I never told people bears always attack from the rear. So, you know, <laughs> I was safe because he would be full by the time he got to me. That was my thinking. It's real stuff, though. It sprays about 15 feet. You know, and of course I read later, the average charging brown bear in Alaska can jump about 30 feet. So apparently, uh, you're supposed to wait till he's right in the middle of his jump, and then, <laughs> ole, kind of do this. Right, let him slide by. <laughs> they don't diagram it on the can for you, but I'm just guessing, just right at the apex, that's where you want to fire. I never actually maced a bear while leading a hike. I, I did have to use it once while I was fishing up there years later. I was, uh, I was standing in a river in Southeast Alaska wearing the hip waders, which are the dorkiest bit of outdoor paraphernalia. <laughs> I was on there kind of ironic, you know, man out there, I wanna go out in the woods and extract nutrients from the wilderness. I wanna live like my forebears, just me and nature. I'll survive. But I, I don't want my legs to be cold and wet. That is like, ooh. <laughs> Well, there's some big pants I can put on, be safe. So, so I've got these hip waders on and I, I hook a fish and I yell, fish on! And my friend Jim, who's about 50 yards away, looks at me and yells, bear! Okay, you guys didn't really laugh at that. Uh, for those who don't know, that is not the proper fish on echo that you're hoping to hear. Maybe you don't fish. 
But sure enough, I looked to my left, and there, poking his head out of the bushes, was this full-grown coastal Alaskan brown bear, over a thousand pounds, just sort of sticking his head out, looking for yummy scrumptables down by the river. <laughs> and at that point, my fish decides it's a good time to, to jump out of the water. Right. Which I know, and not any kind of normal fist jump I'd ever seen either. This was uh, like the, an audition for Field and Stream magazine cover. <laughs> I'm serious, I'd never seen a fish. He came out of the water and then just kept spanking the water with his tail. He wouldn't go back down. <sighs> Little droplets flying like diamonds everywhere. <sighs> the sun glistening off his silver scales. It looked like a share concert. <laughs> This big white salmon belly just full of roe. Just, oh, Mr. Bear. Oh, I feel so full of eggs, I can't even move. I wish someone would just bite me. <laughs> and the bear kind of did a Scooby-Doo, right? He's, and started scampering towards me. So now, technically, I'm not even fishing. I'm trolling for bear. True. I use bait to get bigger bait to get, I don't know how much this daisy chain of bait will continue, but eventually I'm gonna get a redneck if it goes on long enough, right? <laughs> so, so I do what I was trained to do. I whoosh, ripped my bear mace off my Velcro strap and pointed it and went, ah! sprayed it. Now, here's what's missing from the can. Uh, some kind of wind direction indicator. <laughs> Yeah, maybe a little orange windsock at the top, a little rooster with an arrow, anything, really. Because I emptied the can and it all, the wind just blew it all right back in my face. Just every single droplet of that noxious gas and it works. It's unbelievable. I couldn't, instantly, I couldn't see. My mucous membranes were in overdrive. I just sta instantly standing there going, ah, ah, ah. But I'm here to tell you the story because I found out that day bear mace works in two ways. If it gets on the bear, it stings their eyes, they run away. If it gets on you, apparently bears don't like Cajun food. So, <laughs> he left me alone. He, <laughs> I, I couldn't see him because I was blinded, but I could hear him, I swear, 10 feet away and he didn't touch me. He just kind of walked by going. Now <laughs> 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 oh, that's way too spicy. I am not having that. Oh, oh. I want a raw salmon. <laughs> to commemorate the whole thing, I, went, I wanted to get a bear mask uh, at one of the native art stores in Southeast Alaska. So I went in and, uh, you know, the kind of cedar masks they're carved you see up there? And, uh, and so I went to this Native American art store and uh, not as easy as I thought it would be because they did have a gorgeous bear mask, but I looked at the price, <laughs> 3,000 bucks. Yeah, for wood. I was thinking I could take $3,000 in carving lessons, come pretty darn close. But... <laughs> but honestly, then I thought, well, maybe this is carved by the greatest native carver in all of Southeast Alaska. Maybe this is the mask I gotta have, right? It'll increase in value, it'll be a real treasure. So I pick up a card about the artist, not so much. <laughs> carved by a guy named Tony, who grew up in New Jersey. Now. <laughs> That should not be legal at the native art store, in my opinion. That, uh, right, I, I wanted something authentic. I don't know what that meant, but I was picturing some 90-year-old guy with long gray hair. You know, Every night I like to go into the forest. <laughs> and I run with the great bears. <laughs> then I shapeshift into a bear. <laughs> and I have many bear children. Then I awake in my human form and I carve my children into the wood of the great cedar. So I can sell them for 3,000 bucks. Right. right, that's what I wanted. Uh, yo, my name's Tony, how you doing? Huh? Yeah, I moved out to Alaska from Jersey a few years ago so I could start carving stuff because I heard you can make serious cash. This here, this is a bear. Yeah, well, I started out as a beaver, but I messed up his tooth, so... I shape-shifted him into a bear, you know what I'm saying? I am the first American in my family, too. My, my, my uh, uh, yeah, the first. My, my parents, my dad's Canadian. 
Yeah. <laughs> he laughs. That's not really not American. That's not American light. Yeah, he, uh, he was a pilot in the Royal Canadian Air Force. <laughs> well, it was a long time ago, so it was more. <laughs> he doesn't have any cool war stories either. He never was in combat. The closest he got was flying a beaver and drop an ice cold moose head on his buddies. That was as close. It's a flow plane. Okay. My mother, she's actually, they met in Canada, but she's originally from England. She's British. Right. So I was raised by a British mum. Super. Which has affected me. Like, I think about it today. Today, I, the only news I watch, the BBC, because it, by far that is one of the best gifts to the planet that the British have ever given. It is by far the best news broadcast. You cannot turn it off. Yeah, okay. Okay, see, some of you haven't given it a chance. Let me explain. Here's the problem with American news. They take boring stories and try to make them sound exciting. So we're always hearing things like, is it still safe to wash your car in the driveway with the kids around? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Tune in at 11 and find out. <laughs> you walk around half paranoid. Oh, keep the kids away from the sassy driveway. <laughs> the BBC, I swear, it's the, it's the opposite. They take actually horrifying stories and calm them down beyond all reason. <laughs> Watch war coverage on the BBC. There'll be a hot zone and right in the middle of it, this skinny Brit going, this is Batley Mortimer Stokes reporting live for the BBC. <laughs> I am here in front of an enemy ammunition facility. Notice on the side of the building, a small red dot. Yes, this is actually part of a laser guiding missile system was developed by the Pentagon to deliver a weapon with a pinpoint accuracy. If I was standing here, it would literally hit me in the chest. Which is why I have chosen to stand here. I don't, you can't turn that off. And they, they never quit, they never quit. The missile comes in, you're just, whoa, we've just been hit. Super, brilliant. This is precisely how I had imagined events would unfold. I am in some kind of giant crater out right now, out of which I do plan to crawl the moment I find my leg. Now, there, there it is. No, that is not mine, unfortunate. If you see a red dot, I recommend running like a bastard. This is rather awkward. I truly wish I was washing the vehicles at home in the driveway with the children. What could possibly go wrong in that idyllic scenario? Back to you, Heathcliff. Super! <laughs> Some people in other countries think Americans are arrogant. I know. It's ridiculous. Anybody who thinks we're arrogant is an idiot, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> they can bite my Yankee Doodle, all right? I don't even know what a Yankee Doodle is, but it's, it's always sounded biteable to me. I... <laughs> Actually, a guy came up to me once after a show, and he goes, uh, hey, do you have that bite my Yankee Doodle thing on a t-shirt? And I, no. <laughs> but I do now. Yeah, that was a good idea. <laughs> Actually made one. Yeah, it's, it looks just like an American flag from a distance, but you get up close and it's actually made of the words bite my Yankee Doodle, right? <laughs> That's right, because I... <laughs> I feel we are not arrogant, but if we are, it's from time to time, at least we're subtle about it. <laughs> and I know, I, I would never stop in the middle of a TV comedy special to pitch merchandise that you can get at davidcrow.com. I would never do that, that would be... <laughs> That would be classless. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> I do have another t-shirt that I made. Uh, this is... This is a can and the label on the can just says, duh. It's, it's, it's a can of duh. It's a Canada shirt. Yeah. <laughs> this is... Ode to my heritage. And of course, I would never say, go to my website and get one. I would never say that be classless. Here's what really annoys me, is I don't know anything about cars. 
<laughs> so I can't even have a good debate. I didn't take auto shop. I took band. <laughs> yeah, I know, you too. Yeah, I played trombone for years, got really good at it, only to find out no matter how good you are at trombone, it never really comes in handy later in life, all right? You can't... I can't whip my trombone out around a campfire when I'm 57. Anyone for a little satin doll? Three years, first chair, let's rock. I don't know what you did with your youth. I spent most of mine in my parents' basement going My mom would stick her head in. Dave, there's girls outside. You should go meet one. That's okay, mom. I master this. They'll come to me. <laughs> No, they won't, actually. No, they won't. That's, that's what else I learned. Trombone not meant for romance. One, it's got a spit valve, okay? If you want to learn an instrument to romance somebody, don't get one that hawks up its own goober every 10 minutes. That'll spoil every magical moment you manage to conjure with your talent, your gift. Hang on, honey, one more song. Where are you going? And I'm not saying I didn't have a good time in band. I love band. It had big influence on my life. My, I had a great jazz teacher, and I still listen to jazz. Love jazz. Love it. Yeah, and I credit my jazz teacher. And real jazz, too, by the way. Right? Not smooth jazz. I don't know whose idea that was, but not everything is better smooth. Okay? okay? Diarrhea, that's smooth. No one's happy about that scenario, right? No one's... No one's, oh, it's easy listening today. Good. Right? Jazz is art. Art hurts a little sometimes, you know? Art is sometimes a struggle. That's why Miles Davis played with a plunger on occasion, because he had some stuff to work out. Just... <laughs> he didn't just low note his music all over the room. <laughs> That's so easy to hear. <laughs> okay, I'm relating to like me and two other people in the room. This is... Actually, it's kind of funny though, a, a while back I was working with a black comic and he heard me talk about jazz on stage and in the green room afterwards he sits down and says, you know, I don't know if you know the history of jazz, but black people, we actually brought jazz to this country. What happened is, is we brought uh, the African rhythms and gospel and turned that into rhythm and blues and that evolved into jazz and rock and roll and really the whole American songbook is based on that contribution and without it, this country wouldn't have the music it is so proud of. And I thought, I did not know that. <laughs> and I was kind of jealous. That was the other surprise. I felt jealous. Not of the music. I was jealous of how comfortable he was just plunking down in front of me and bragging about stuff his people did. <laughs> yeah, because as a white guy, I would feel sheepish about doing that. I didn't know how to... It's not like I'm going to go, oh, that's great. We brought some stuff, too. We brought golf and Santa and ham <laughs> and pants. And chemical engineering and guns, pow, pow, and space exploration and the crock pot and the Swiffer and bowling, pretty sure that was ours. Uh, curling, definitely ours. We brought the Constitution. We kind of brought the whole idea of this country to this country. We brought, uh, well, I don't know how you tell you this, we brought black people to this country, so, you know. In a way, we brought jazz and rock and roll. Or, I mean, we drove the limo, I mean, if you think of it that way. Yeah, that's gonna be awkward. <laughs> so, but I digress. Uh, I don't know anything about cars. Uh, if my car breaks down, all I can do is listen to jazz until AAA comes or maybe take the radiator hose and play something to myself. <laughs> yes, I'll tell you about my family. Actually, uh, first of all, here's my story in a nutshell. I, I found myself uh, about 40 years old and uh, single 
And uh, so I thought, oh, maybe I should try some online dating. And I, I know there's some young people in the room here. And, uh, and I, I wanna tell you this as a, as a favor to you. Okay, date as much as you can when you're young because that's the easiest it gets. It doesn't get easier when you're older. Here's why. When you're young, when you're in college, you can go on a first date and you can say something like, well, I'm in pre-med right now, and the uh, plan is to go to med school, become an orthopedic surgeon, you know, set up a clinic once I graduate, and maybe have some waterfront property and a house in the mountains, and uh, do charity work in the Himalayas from time to time. And your date will look across the table and think, wow, you are amazing. Okay, you go on a first date when you're 40 and say that exact same thing. <laughs> Both of you know none of that's happening. All right. Because by the time you're middle aged, your major life choices, they've been made, frankly, and you can't escape them. You just gotta, they follow you around like unwanted stepchildren. You just gotta introduce them and hope for the best. Just. Yeah, here's my oldest poor career choice right here. Yeah, been with me 20 years now. Doesn't seem to wanna get out of the house. Uh, here's my second one, alimony. This, should, sh this one should be gone in a couple years. Uh, here are my twins. Wish I had brushed my teeth more and hair plugs. Yeah, well, they, they can't all be winners, but you learn to love them. And this is my latest one, only six months old, uh, DUI. I did not expect, we, we call it oops. Um, So I, uh, I, a while back, I tried online dating uh, a number of years ago, uh, and uh, yeah, and I didn't want to, but I, I got lured in by one of those sites, right? I was just kind of investigating, and uh, here's the deal. You gotta fill out a personality profile, which if you're like me, that's a hundred questions you've never thought about in your life. <laughs> you know, you've got me. <laughs> I'm an armchair philosopher. What's more important to you, loyalty or honesty? What is more important to me? Is there money involved? Or... Some of the stuff's easy. You know, what do, what's your favorite dessert? I like pie, so I just wrote that, pie. Actually, all caps, three times. Pie, pie, pie! Because <laughs> it was the first one I was really confident about the answer. The, uh... hey, but here's the problem with these things. Okay, you're supposed to be honest yet you're trying to get someone to like you. And it's just, it's just counterintuitive for a lot of these questions. Okay, what do you like to do with your leisure time? Are you gonna be honest about that answer, really? I mean, how interesting is your leisure time, really? 99% of your leisure time, really. I mean, what am I supposed to, well, I like to sit on the sofa, look at the cat, uh, say, kitty! a hundred times and then I pick at my heel because the skin builds up on the outside and, and sometimes if I'm lucky I actually get a little skin ball roll it up throw it at the cat and whoa, it scares him hey. so that's a good Tuesday night and uh, cat people fleshy feet people both maybe so I, I did what I think most people do. You take everything you've ever done that's interesting, put it into one weekend. <laughs> right, you're ridiculous on the opposite end of the spectrum. Well, I usually wake up and go mountain biking or hiking, and then I hang glide back to my car or <laughs> paraglide, weather permitting. And then I'll hunt and kill my own lunch and uh, dress it in the way of the old pioneers and uh, maybe spend the afternoon doing charity work like building yurts for homeless Mongolians. <laughs> I literally got to the end and I, I <laughs> uh, at the bottom, they said for $30, we'll use all this data and plug it into our system and match you with your dream girl. And that's, to be honest, I, I got more paranoid than anything. Or I, I started to think, really, well, the, the computer knows? What if I've been wrong my whole life, you know? Because I've always kind of had this thing for the sporty librarian type with uh, a foreign accent and a PhD and some rental properties. That's all I'm going for. <laughs> what if that's 
is way off. What if I'm more the Walmart cashier type with a Ford Festiva and a lot of guns in her basement kind of guy? <laughs> Only one way to find out. So I sent the money in. They matched me up with a pediatric anesthesiologist from South Africa. Cha-ching. <laughs> yeah. Best $30 return I've ever had. So I didn't even know what it was when I met her to a pediatric anesthesiologist. Turns out she almost kills children for a living. <laughs> That's what she told me. She said, well, scientifically, we use drugs and chemicals to shut down your body and hover you over the abyss. Well, and then while well, they do the operation and then you brought back into the world of the living and then stabilize from the massive trauma and prevent you going to shock. Yeah, that's basically what I do, which is gonna come in handy when we have to discipline our own kid, I think. <laughs> You better clean your room. Your mother will show you the white light of Jesus. No! no. <laughs> I know. So we have a little girl now, and, uh, and people mean well with their parenting advice, but a lot of it doesn't apply when you have an anesthesiologist on hand all the time. Oh, you're having a baby? You're not going to get a good night's sleep for a while. I think we'll be okay. <laughs> Yeah, mommy has a toolbox, a little, little spritzer called Baby Be Quiet. <laughs> we went to South Africa to, meet, uh, to visit the grandparents, and that's a 17-hour flight, you know, around the plane, and everybody was just, just complimenting us on how well-behaved our little child was on, on the 17-hour flight. Well, you know, it's just good parenting, being on the same page, trying some of the most modern methods. And really, sometimes I, sometimes you just have a gift for these things. I can't explain it, but we're done talking now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I love being a dad. I was, uh, I didn't, um, you know, uh, it changes your perspective a lot, having a little kid around. And I, I know you're looking at me like, well, you're a little old to start a family. I know that now. It's tiring, and it, all the work is down here. I just do more couch parenting. I, I pick that up from watching the grandparents. They know what that's all about. They just get all comfy on the sofa. Bring it here. I'll show you how it works. Bring it here. <laughs> Go get it. I know, that's about my speed. Young parents way overly involved. You see, young parents, let's be frogs. Do you know how frogs jump? <laughs> Can you jump like a froggy? I got two jumps in me, and then, all right, keep jumping, Froggy, keep jumping. No, don't touch that, that's the heater, it's very hot. No, no, no! Ouch. All right, come over here, I'll kiss it better. Come on, hop this way, burnt frog. I don't know why we stop wearing baby clothes, I don't know why we are. Look at how we're all dressed, it's kind of ridiculous. Babies have the best clothes, that, that onesie thing? I know, just, just a single zipper, your shoes are on, you're cozy. <laughs> That's all you need. But I remember when the first time I realized how much kids change your perspective. Uh, it's my sister gave us an extra saucer. And uh, if you don't know what this is, it's a little plastic ring with uh, some toys glued on it and a pair of swim trunks kind of suspended in the middle. <laughs> You set it on your kitchen floor, and then you take your little squirmy trot baby, and you put it in the swim trunks, and it can't escape. <laughs> so it just fiddles with the toys, so you have time to make a sandwich, right? That's all it is. It's a baby clamp. <laughs> okay, I cannot tell you the amount of joy that registered on this little girl's face the first time I put her in this exerciser and watched her turn from little plastic toy to little plastic toy to a spinny clicky wheel. It spins and it clicks. It's amazing. Oh, a star on a springy stick. It's a star that springs and a wheel that clicks. And I was watching that as a middle-aged man thinking, oh my gosh, 
I had no idea how jaded and bitter I have become. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't even want to think at my age what my exorcister would have to have on it <laughs> to get even half that response from me. Or you can't put a jet ski on an exorcister, you can't. In South Africa, I did probably had the adventure of my life. Uh, while we were down there, uh, I rode an ostrich. That was my big... Yeah, thank you for your lack of interest. There's... Yeah, okay, I... Okay, maybe you're animal rights people and you're thinking about the poor ostrich. I just want you to know I did not go there to ride ostriches. I'd never even heard of that activity, but I was just driving down this dirt road out in the middle of nowhere and saw this sign that said ostrich riding. My plans changed immediately. <laughs> we are doing this. Here's what I found out about it. Uh, uh, one, they don't look as rideable live and in person as you thought they would when you read the sign. Yeah, they don't. They're walking around on these ridiculously tall, skinny legs. And, and it looks like they're wearing these gorgeous, multi-thousand dollar pure ostrich skin, you know, full length boots, just. <laughs> but they're kind of new boots, because they're not that stable. So there's a little bit of this, I don't think I'll be able to dance in these. <laughs> and then there's nowhere to sit on them. Their body is really just this feather. <laughs> And then their head sticks out the top like a big scared hot dog. <laughs> yeah, they look like a one-man pride parade float. That's what they look like, okay? <laughs> and secondly, I'm an American tourist in a foreign country living under the false assumption everything's gonna run like it does in my own country. I know it's kind of ridiculous in hindsight, but I was literally in the middle of Nowhere thinking, whoa, I'll probably start out by signing a waiver. <laughs> then I'll get a helmet. <laughs> Meet my bird, learn his name. Hey, buddy, how are you? I guess you're my bird today. And then we'll have a guide. You always have a guide, right? It's a tour. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll undoubtedly have an old, tired bird, and the guide will have a much younger, sportier bird. He'll be showing off a little bit. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the tour. <laughs> Whatever. This is his deal. He can be the king. <laughs> and then ostrich riding. I'm picturing a tour, so I'm picturing 10 of us in a line just kind of walking around looking for hippos for an hour. <laughs> you know, I'll... I'll, I'll I'll probably want to kick mine in the high and see how fast we can go. And they, yeah, they won't let me, but whatever. It'll still be fun. I'm doing it. <laughs> All right, here's the deal. <laughs> if you're the kind of person who doesn't really like signing waivers and wearing a helmet and being part of a little tour that doesn't let you go as fast as you want to, you need to get yourself to Africa, okay? Because <laughs> they don't do any of that. <laughs> it's just some guy that woke up that morning. I think I'll make money having foreign people ride wild animals today. And he did. Here's, here's why it works. Apparently, ostriches have tiny brains. In fact, what I read is their brain is actually smaller than one of their eyeballs. Yeah, so they can't train them, they're too dumb. Did that stop the whole activity? No. <laughs> they found a loophole. All they did, uh, because they have to see, if there's not something right in front of their face, they don't feel fear. That's how dumb they are. So they just grab one under the chin, choke it for a second. Before the bird can turn and fight, they throw a bag on its head, and the bird just mellowed out. Well, that was weird. I swear someone was choking me a second ago. I just see beige now. And then the guide, he goes, uh, okay, get on. Followed by the one phrase you never really want to hear in a foreign country, it is no problem, my friend. <laughs> right, that's foreign speak for the tourist is about to entertain the locals. That's what that is, okay? 
It means it's no problem for him. It is no problem for me. I have my money. But you, it is a wild bird. Maybe there is a problem. <laughs> so I hop on incorrectly. Well, I thought it would be like any other animal. I figured I'd just kind of plunk down on the top, scooch forward, squeeze my knees together, grab the neck. I don't know, point the head where I want to go, right? I mean, it's like going to be like a big video game, really. That's all this is. I got this. It's not how you do it. You end up sitting near the back. And then you slide your legs under the wings. They fall across your thighs like big feathery chaps. You, you hook your feet around the front, and then you hold the wings way out by the elbow. Yes, this is not a secure feeling position, and it certainly doesn't feel like it will respond to steering. The first thing the guide said was kind of shocking. He says, okay, don't touch the neck. They don't like that which is disappointing when you're a first-time rider because that's the go-to safety handle right in front of your face. And now you can't use it? Okay. Not as shocking as the second thing he said, which, which he looks at me, pinches the bag and says, are you ready? <laughs> what? No safety tips? No do's and don'ts? <laughs> Scariest part of that question, though, the total look of excitement on his face. <laughs> Let this be a little tip for you, world travelers. You always want your tour guide to look a little bored. You know why? Because he's doing this all day, every day. Nothing should be exciting anymore. But apparently in this case, what was about to happen never gets old. Never. He's been doing it 20 years. It's like day one every day. He could not wait to pull the ripcord on this one more time. <laughs> so anyway, he rips the bag off, and this is when it got really weird. Everything slowed down. I could hear my heart pump in slow motion. <laughs> Suddenly aware of this whistling nose hair. I had no idea it had been there all day. I'm just staring at the back of this bald, prickly head. And it slowly starts to turn sideways. Oh, no. I... And right as I thought, I guess nothing's going to happen. The bird goes, and runs away. And I just hung on. That's all I did. I just clung for about 30 seconds. And frankly, I was kind of proud of that. I was very proud. And then I was shown the video, and I'm not proud of any of it. Not proud. Not proud. You ever have a video ruin a perfectly good memory? Yeah, in my mind, it had been quite a glorious feat. And then I watched the video. What really happened, he took off so fast, I slipped off the back. First step out of the gate, funk. All right, feet still locked around the front, by the way. Hanging onto the wings, face kind of bouncing on the feathers. There were a couple of squeals. I won't lie to you. I just... And then my feet came unlocked. But did I let go? Oh, no, fuck. Now I'm just gonna hang on, and now I'm flopping, and whoo, squealing, and flopping, whoo. It just looked like I was humping some Jurassic turkey for 30 seconds. Yeah, and the expression on the bird makes it no better. So anyway, I guess I tell you this story in case you ever go to Africa and want to do this and it's no longer legal. It's my fault. I just want to apologize. <laughs> hey, thanks for joining us at Dry Bar Comedy, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks.